SJC 11468, Commonwealth versus Levi Omar Alcantara. Good morning, Mr. Baylor. Why don't you wait one moment and you can get started. That's right, thank you. Thank you. All right. All Good yours. morning. May it please the court, Jeffrey Baylor for Mr. Alcantara. Here we contend that the jury was improperly instructed that they could consider Mr. Alcantara's statement for consciousness <clears throat> of guilt. Um, prior to trial, uh, Mr. Alcantara's statement to police was suppressed as involuntary. However, during trial, uh, Mr. Alcantara sought to introduce the statement on Bowdoin and third-party culprit grounds. So the third, if I, if I understand correctly, and, the, and, and ultimately it was allowed only on Bowdoin grounds, I get that. But if he sought it, on third-party culprit grounds, it would be for the truth, correct? Right, right. So, so I guess I'm. My question is, given that, um, and and um, why would it mean? Well, this is one. I have two questions, but the first one is, given his position, <clears throat> why then can he say it's reversible error if? Um, somebody were to consider it for the truth? Because it was only allowed in on Bowdoin grounds, which would mean not, that it's not allowed in for its truth. The jury was specifically instructed. The judge sort of uh, uh, helped him out by not allowing it in for what he wanted it for? Well, I mean, it just, it put it in a, it put it in, in a different light, and then the jury is not considering it, you know, for its truth during the course of trial. They're not weighing it. Trial counsel is not gearing his questioning to uh, it being admitted for its truth. Uh, it, was, it was only admitted for, uh, in terms of Bowdoin, and the jury was specifically instructed um, after the, an agreement with the com by the Commonwealth that it should only come in uh, as it related to police investigation. Okay, so here's my second question okay. then. All right, all that's true. Um, we get to the closings and the final charge. The judge doesn't repeat the instruction right. about it's, it's a Bowdoin only, but in giving the consciousness of guilt, nor does she mention his statement. She just says statements. And as I understand it, neither does the prosecutor. In, in other words, the, the Commonwealth's argument on this point is, well, how do, it could equally be the case that the jury, having heard that limiting instruction during the trial, hearing nothing to countermand it, um, and hearing no specific reference to the, um, uh, to the defendant's statement by either the prosecution or <coughs> the judge uh, in closing, why, why is it that we assume that it, it um, uh, used it incorrectly? That at least incorrectly well, I mean, in terms of the limiting instruction. It would instruction. be possible that they relied on that initial instruction, but I think going through <coughs> the trial, it was obviously when they talked about a statement, they were talking about this particular statement. The, the other the, the statements, didn't there she? There was other statements, there but were. All, all they were was when, he, when police initially, um, initially found him, um, he, he <coughs> just said a few lines like, they were trying to kill me, I escaped. I, I, I have it quoted in my brief, but uh, it was just like a couple, a few lines, and then this long statement was introduced, uh, the one that he, that's at issue here, where he went into detail, there was four guys who came into the apartment, two of them forced him out and took his property and clothing, and he escaped. Okay. So when the, when the judge was talking about statement and closing, and I think it's clear from the argument about during the charge conference as to whether or not this, this uh, instruction should be given, that, that the, his statement to police was really the statement that everyone was thinking of, not just these couple things that he happened to say before he was uh, arrested. But the Commonwealth would say to that, um, well, of course, if it's consciousness of guilt, it's not in for the truth, it's in for the fact that it's not true. <coughs> Is that? But in order, for, in order for the jury to be able to um, consider consciousness of guilt evidence, they have to be able to decide whether or not something was, was true. 
or oh, true I see. So, or false. so it's it's. I see your point. It's not it's not in for a sort of um, as an object. It's in there for its contents. Is what you're saying? Exactly. Yeah. So when you, that's why Bowden's not hearsay, and even if something is suppressed, it shouldn't be. I think everyone understood that it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. Um, barred from uh, use by the defendant in terms of uh, Bowdoin because it's not being offered to say this is true, this is what happened, just that police were told about these other, that, about these other men and that they should have properly, properly investigated it. Well, Bowdoin is, I mean, it, it comes in as hearsay. It is hearsay, what came in. Uh, I don't, I mean, I'm trying to think through what you're saying. You wanted it, your client wanted it in with regard to Bowdoin. Right. Bowdoin means essentially to preserve the ability to argue to the jury, they had plausible other theories which they failed to properly investigate. Right. And doesn't the jury, isn't part of the Bowdoin analysis of a jury to evaluate the plausibility of those other alternatives? Because if the police did not investigate them, can't a jury say, well, of course they didn't investigate them. That was totally outlandish. It was ridiculous. There was no reason to pursue that preposterous claim that he made. And isn't that essentially evaluating it at some level, maybe not for its truth, but for its plausibility as to whether or not it is a matter worthy of investigation? Well, I, 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 I suppose that that's true, but in Bowdoin's, I think specifically, this, or in the cases addressed of Bowdoin, mm -hmm. this, this court says that the reason that it's less problematic than third-party culprit evidence, which would be for its truth, that this person did it and here's the evidence that someone did it, that in Bowdoin's case, it's not hearsay because it's not being offered for the truth that this is actually what happened, just that the police it goes to what the police should do, not whether, whether what was said was true or not, but in this light, did the police follow up uh, appropriately? Right. But it goes, I take it, it also goes to whether or not this information was provided to the police, right? So this, it comes in to show that the information was provided to right, the police. Right, right, and, and what the information was. But, yeah, but, but why should the police uh, <clears throat> go chasing and uh, go b some fanciful pursuit? Well, I mean, it will be up to the jury. Um, to decide whether it was fanciful or had some merit to and, it. And, and I think in, also this court says that in the case of Bowdoin, that the, the Commonwealth has an opportunity to, to explain uh, why the police didn't do, you know, follow it up or whatever they didn't do so that it's a double-edged sword for a defendant. They're saying police should have done that, but then the police can come on and explain it. Um, and the explanation can be, I thought it was so fanciful as to be unworthy of my investigation. Well, then, you know, they could come and say that. But, you know, but that takes it, but in order for it to be admissible for consciousness of guilt, we're saying that it has to have come in I mean, substantively, whether it should have been believed or not, not whether it, not here where it just came in to show that police knew about this this uh, other theory of the case and and that they didn't uh, follow up on it. Um, I guess mo moving on, I'd like to address uh, um, a couple of the other issues. We also contend that. Uh, Mr. Alcantara should have been permitted to introduce uh, third-party uh, culprit evidence um, relating to uh, testimony of Trooper O'Neill and Lieutenant Dowling and uh, a convenience store clerk and even uh, the defendant's statement. Um, during trial, there was a voir dire of Trooper O'Neill and Lieutenant Dowling, <laughs> and Trooper O'Neill said that he received uh, word that Shabbily, who was uh, the decedent's daughter, had told uh, an individual that Mr. Santos, who was uh, the decedent's boyfriend, uh, that he uh, that he had threatened her and said something bad was going to happen to her. 
Um, but, but we don't have any time frame, among other problems well, with this, do in we? In terms of time frame, the evidence at trial uh, said that they had broken up uh, their relationship one or two days before this occurred. Right, but that, that doesn't necessarily mean that he couldn't have said it before. I mean, we don't know anything about the, what, the, what the course of that relationship was. But I think it would be reasonable to infer that this happened after they had, had broken up. And even if not, I mean, it was during the course of their relationship. And I, I can't remember off the top of my head uh, if, the, if the length of their relationship was in, um, in the record. But I, I, I don't believe, it, I, if it was, it, it, something tells me that it wasn't a long time. But anyway, um, the one or two days, I think it, it would be reasonable to infer that th that's when this uh, occurred. Um, uh, also, um, uh, the com a convenience store clerk, I know that this is a little farther removed, said that uh, she had heard that Mr. Santos said that she got what he, what he deserved. That, that was the word on the street, I think. The word on the street, right. I mean, doesn't the judge have um, the ability to kind of weigh? I mean, may, she, she's got discretion and to, to, to use her judgment as to whether, you know, how much meat these um, allegations of third-party culprit have and whether they, whether they are feeble or not. To I, I think this court, as a court in the brief, that gives you, says that a wide latitude should be given to the defendant. And I mean, these, the decedent's boyfriend was initially mentioned that right after the incident and police, his nickname was Louie, and police put the word out to go look for Louie and they went to his house. So he was definitely at least mentioned in this case as a possible suspect. And then Do you have to show anything about this third person that connects them in a physical way, or is it simply enough to kind of go into their state of mind about their relationship with this person? It, it seems to me that all you've got is, is a spurned lover here, and it doesn't mean that this person has a motive to kill. I mean, you've just got that standing out there, and there's nothing to say that he did anything or anybody saw him in the area when this thing happened. I mean, it's just, it's so attenuated. Well, I guess that that would be a consideration, but yes, we have a sperm lover, and then we have him threatening to kill her. I mean, that seems- Where, where is that? The threat to kill her? Uh, that's what uh, Shabbily told- uh, That he said something bad would happen, but is that a threat to kill? <clears throat> Well, was watch her back? Was that something um, about watch it, her back? The second, also the second, yes, yeah, she said. Um, it would be different if he said, I'm going to kill you because okay. you um, left me. But well, that's not what Lieutenant he said. Lieutenant Dowling uh, was told that uh, Mr. Santo said um, <clears throat> he was going to have her killed. So, I mean, it's all these things combined, you know, in they, they're closely connected to this case. There's a threat to kill someone who was killed. He had just broken up with her one or two days before. It at least should have come in to show you know, that there was a possibility that someone else was involved. Plus, there was other evidence at trial that the identification evidence was questioned. The, the boys who were the, 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 eyewitness, uh, the eyewitnesses testified that the, the the person was wearing totally different clothes than what Mr. Uh, Alcantara was observed wearing just before this occurred. But, but the, the child, uh, Jesus, knew the defendant, knew who he was, and they saw both him attacking his brother. Well, they, they knew him, but it, it, it be, there was dim lighting. It could have been someone who looked like him. They knew that he frequented the place, and they just thought that was him. But at least there was enough to question whether or not it but was him. But what they said was they knew it was Santos's cousin, or something. I mean, it was. I, it, they connected him to the because he was a friend of San, Santos, the right name. Right, Santos. Yeah. Yes. So, so 
they're distinguishing, but at least distinguishing between those two people in their identification. Right, but but that should have been something that could have, that should have been left to the jury. There was also this other evidence, like the clothes didn't match, DNA uh, that wasn't Mr. Alcantara's uh, was found. There was hair found in in the decedent's fingernails that clearly wasn't his. There was uh, it, there was uh, fingerprints that that wasn't his. So it wasn't like an open and shut case. There was these. To, to kids who said, yeah, we know this guy and that's who it was, but there was also other evidence, including Louis being mentioned right after the incident as, as a, a suspect. So there clearly was other evidence that this wasn't, uh, you know, it was not like it wasn't challenged. It should have, at least the jury should have been able to hear this other evidence, you know. Counsel, to, let, me, let, let me ask you this. With respect to third party culprit, I, I, I take it testimony was permitted or did come out at trial that Mr. Santos had recently broken up? Yes, it did. And did Mr. Santos testify? No, he didn't. Okay. So the issue of whether Mr. Santos might have been culpable was certainly explored at trial, no? It, it was slightly, but, but wasn't I mean, it explored not, not, nothing in a, like this. In a Bowdoin context, though? <clears throat> I'm wasn't sorry. wasn't the lack of investigation or the poor investigation into Santos as a possible culprit explored as a Bowdoin issue? Well, that that was my next point that these statements also weren't in, allowed in uh, in a Bowdoin context. Uh, Trooper O'Neill testified that you know he received this. Um, at this I'm talking about at the voir dire. Trooper O'Neill testified that he received this information uh, about Mr. Santos. Um, they went to Mr. Santos's house, and his father said he wasn't home, but that night he was interviewed at the police station. Mr. Santos said that he was with his parents the whole time. But Trooper O'Neill testified that they never followed up after that. They never checked with the parents or, or anybody else uh, to see if what Mr. Santos said was true. But that's the Bowdoin, that's the Bowdoin evidence. Right, that's, that's, and that, that's wasn't the, that wasn't allowed in, though. That wasn't allowed in? No, it was not allowed in. It wasn't allowed in that they didn't ever check up? No, it was not allowed in. That was part of the voir dire, and, and then uh, it, was, it was not, a, it, was, it, was, it was the same voir dire where he said, you know, we received this, this word that Shabley said that Mr. Santos uh, wanted to kill my mother, and police interviewed Mr. Santos, but then they never you know, checked up to see what he was saying was true, and that also wasn't allowed in. Um, be, beyond that, there's a couple other issues I could just briefly mention. Uh, one is that we contend that a portion of Genesis Pina's 911 call should not have been allowed in as an excited utterance. Um, the 911 call was, was permitted in without objection except for a small portion of it in which he said um, some guy just went into this house and, uh, and struck a kid. And the evidence of trial showed that she had no personal knowledge that anyone went into the house or this occurred, um, that she arrived at the scene after the incident and never went in the house. Um, it was allowed in because the, the trial judge found that it was an excited utterance within an excited utterance. But we contend that there was nothing indicating where Ms. Pina got this, uh, got this other, um, got this statement from that someone went into the house. Uh, so that it should have been... There was some sense of proximity in time to the actual events, and she referred to somebody being bloodied who was outside, correct? Right. But so can, can, is it not a fair inference that that information came from somebody who was himself or herself excited? Well, I mean, we just don't know. I mean, she just starts saying, you know, the kid went in and there was blood, without any indication of who said it. It could have been three times removed from the scene or... Do, do we know who the... I'm, I'm not going to pronounce this right, but Gudo or Judo, do we no, know who that it, was? No, who that I mean, is? I, it was unclear whether that was a name or a mistranslation or maybe it was something in Spanish, but... I couldn't tell whether it was a third person. But yeah, I, I, I mean, it was not... There was nothing more than that, just that that's what she said. 
Well, in the scheme of things, how much did this matter to well, it the, supported, the outcome? Well, it supported the boy's statement that one guy came in rather than, you know, multiple people came in, uh, as, you know, as Mr. Alcantara said. So it was a central, a central point uh, in the case. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. It pleads the court. Catherine Semmel on behalf of the Commonwealth. The, uh, as, a, as an initial matter, the judge properly um, concluded that um, the defendant's custodial statement that he had had admitted could be considered for consciousness of guilt. And um, Why? Just... G given that she'd limited it and it was kept out on voluntariness grounds. The, I think it was discussed very, very clearly um, when, when this issue came up that the only reason the judge was allowing the statement in at all was because the defendant was explaining that he can waive um, the suppression of the evidence, that he can, he can rape, uh, waive his right to have the evidence excluded, and defendants waive their rights to certain privileges and benefits all the time. <clears throat> and once he had done that, once he had said, I don't want the evidence suppressed, then I think we're just looking at it as a regular piece of evidence. No, but she limited it. So, I mean, doesn't he, I mean, once she limited it, doesn't he get to take advantage of that? I, I, I don't think so. I think that, that, that once he has waived suppression, then, and has put the evidence in, then if there are other permissible uses of that evidence under traditional standards of evidence, then they can be considered for those other well, purposes. Number one, he, if I understand it correctly, he didn't waive suppression altogether. He said it could come in, or he wanted it to come in. He proposed that it come in for Bowdoin and third party culprit reasons, correct? Right. But so he wasn't, okay, she said no, it's only coming in for Bowdoin purposes. Correct. So. I guess I, I mean, I, I think there is some val some legitimacy to the point, well, okay, you limited it, now you can't, um, that, that it's not entirely proper just to say, well, you, you, you said it could come in for something different, so we're gonna treat it as though you wanted it in for all purposes. Well, the, the judge made a mistake about whether or not it had been allowed in for all purposes. Um, the. the the Commonwealth withdrew its objection to Bowdoin. The, the judge gave an instruction for limiting it to Bowdoin. And later on, the judge, the judge thought that the Commonwealth had withdrawn its objection altogether, um, a, a mistake that the defendant didn't correct as soon as the judge said that she was not going to give her new Bowdoin, her Bowdoin instruction in the final charge, which was, of course, of substantial benefit to the defense to <clears throat> not have the jury reminded. Um, but, but, did, but I but think did the judge ever say earlier in the trial, I told you that that evidence is limited and I made a mistake and it should not be so limited? No, she never said that. So, so, that, so, so as far as the jury knew, yes, it was still limited. Exactly. Exactly. The jury never heard anything differently. The, our, our discussion. That's a, yeah, that, that, I, I agree with that. That's a different point than you're making right now, though. It, it is a different point, but, but I would say, I would, I would just say based on the Chief Justice's point, it's a largely academic point in terms of the fact that, that the whole discussion about whether this was consciousness of guilt evidence was between the attorneys and the judge and was not communicated to the jury. And there was, in fact, several other pieces of, fault, of consciousness of guilt evidence that was specifically argued uh, by the prosecutor and that fit within the false statements. What did the judge say in, in a limiting instruction? Um, when, the, um, when the statement was originally introduced, yeah. um, she said, essentially that, that um, she said first the Commonwealth couldn't have introduced it previously. Um, why which is did why she say that? It just seemed to me this was such a loaded instruction to me. I, I, I think the, that the prosecutor had argued that, that they did not want it held against them, that we didn't put that in our case in chief. And she was just making clear, I think, that the defendant had the, that the, de the, defendant had the option of, of introducing it, but that the Commonwealth had not. And then she said that that it was um, to be it was to be considered solely for solely in relation to the mm -hmm. police investigation, is what she said when the evidence came in. And then there was no there was no statement taking that back. Um, and in closing, the judge did not repeat the Bowdoin instruction. 
um, and, did argue, and did give an instruction on consciousness of guilt relating to false statements. And the prosecutor, in her closing, when she referenced the custodial statement, referenced it specifically with regard to the police investigation and not any broadly. And the defense made rampant use of the statement, which was of great benefit to them, um, based upon the defendant stating that he had grabbed the <coughs> hammer in particular, which would explain his DNA um, on the hammer. So I, I, I do think that- oh, so, so he had used it substantively? He, he in, also- In closing. He, I, he also related it to, to Bowdoin at times, I mean, to, to the police investigation, but I think he came, if he didn't use it substantively, he came much closer than the prosecution did, um, understandably, because it was very beneficial information for him. Um, so so I, I do think that it was within the judge's discretion um, um, and that it was used for a non-hearsay purpose. Consciousness of guilt is an, another non-hearsay purpose. Um, but that in any event that the judge wasn't precluded when the, when the defendant uh, waived his right to have the evidence suppressed and where it was otherwise proper. Um, but in any event, it was cumulative of other evidence in support of consciousness of, of guilt, and the jury was never instructed to consider that as consciousness of guilt evidence. Um, and this is a case, I would just say, and I, I, um, I don't use this term lightly before this court or any other appellate court, but, but I do think there was overwhelming evidence of guilt in this case. Um, there were two IDs by, by, by people who, who knew the defendant. Um, um, he had been seen on a Store 24 videotape with the victim. Um, there were some time discrepancies, but not too many minutes before the offense occurred. Um, in addition, there was really damaging DNA evidence. There was a lot of DNA evidence, but I think some of the most damaging was certainly the defendant's DNA on the hammer and both victims, both Jesus and his mother's um, DNA in blood stains on the shirt, and that was even after he had discarded almost all the clothing that he was seen wearing in the Store 24 tape. Um, the, the, on the um, excited utterance. Yes. Um, help me out here. Is it correct, I mean, isn't it correct that the, the excited utterance um, takes care of the hearsay problem, but the, it doesn't take care of hearsay within hearsay, does it? Um, yes and no. Um, the, um, it, it was agreed by everybody that Genesis, who is the girl who made the 911 call, that her statement was an excited utterance. Everyone agreed about that. To the extent she, and this is what the defendant argued below, to the defense she may, to the extent she may have been repeating what Jesus told her, that it was some guy, and it was those two words explicitly, um, then the defendant argued below, that's hearsay within hearsay, basically, that, or that was based on hearsay, and that part shouldn't come in, and he didn't want it in. The judge never made a clear ruling about this. Um, what she said, if I remember, she said um, it's. She said whether it's the whether child she, whose head is bleeding in front of me or somebody exactly, else. Exactly, whether she is repeating what the child is saying to her who is standing in front of her bleeding from his head or whether she knows it because she saw the person, it doesn't matter, it's, it's coming in. And um, I think that implicit in that ruling is, is an understanding from the judge that, that Jesus' statement would, would also be an excited utterance. Um, and she didn't, she didn't explicitly say that. Um, but I think the defendant had put the issue clearly before, before her that that might have been a re repeating statement and that I think that's what that meant. And if it didn't, if that's not what she meant by that, I'm not sure what she would have meant. And, and certainly this court could, could affirm it for, for a different reason. But um, I, I think she had just listened to all the 911 calls um, when she was ruling on this. It's, it's clear from, from Genesis, she says, you know, she, was, she went outside because Jesus was screaming for her to call an ambulance. And um, I think that the, the context of the, of the entire thing was, was fairly evident that he's bleeding out of his head. She's, he's screaming for her to call an ambulance. I, I, I just think it was, it was beyond dispute that any statement he made to her was also an excited utterance. And I think that's what the judge meant uh, when she said that. And I'm sorry to come on such an unclear record on that point, but I, but I, do, think, I do think that that's what happened. And I would just point out too that the judge 
also noted that the that the um, some guy reference which the defendant argued was was prejudicial and inconsistent with his case was not as inconsistent as the defense suggested that the entire sentence I think was that some kid went inside her neighbor's house and hit a little kid um, and and as the judge pointed out that that the fact that when you take the whole sentence. Who's, whose sentence was that? Some kid? That was Genesis' statement on the 911 call. Some kid or some guy? Some guy, I'm sorry. But it was just those two words, some guy. Some guy was all the defendant wanted taken out of the sentence. And the whole sentence, I believe, was some guy went inside my neighbor's house and hit a little kid. Oh. And, and I think the judge's point was that some, it may have been just one guy who, who hit the child, but that didn't necessarily mean that it was inconsistent with the defense theory that four men came in um, and, and had, had, had done this. Um, so, so just for the prejudice point, point of that, um, I think that the judge's point on that was, was valid. If we can turn to Santos, was there evidence that the jury, I'm sorry, that the children knew Santos? Yes. Yes, he had been to the house. So, and that was in he evidence. Was the boyfriend. So the yes. children would have known Santos as opposed to this other fellow who was the cousin. Yeah, in fact, in, they, they knew the they knew the defendant too, didn't they? They knew both of them, and in fact, I think they they either one or both of them testified that that usually the defendant came with Santos. That's why they they considered him Santos's cousin. They 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 connected him with Santos, but they had seen them together. They certainly knew which who was who. And Santos was actually, you know, the mother's boyfriend for a period of time. And there was some testimony that the defendant had also come by himself um, on other occasions. He had been to the house, you know, a number of times. And certainly. do you agree with your brother that the judge did not allow in evidence the failure to verify the Santos alibi? Um, I, my recollection, Your Honor, is that that is not what the defense was trying to put into evidence. My, my recollection is that the defense was only trying to put in the statements, the, the statements that, that were made, um, the multiple hearsay statements that, that you discussed earlier. Um, I don't think that the defendant wanted to put in the, the, the failure to, um, to investigate because, because then the Commonwealth would have put in that they, in fact, did have Santos come and, and, and they interviewed him and, and they spoke to him. So as it was, I think the jury heard nothing about what the they hear. Did, did I thought they did hear though that that the um, police did not test like the the unidentified DNA. They Absolutely. did not test Santos. For, that, that they was did a, hear a that. Major didn't point they? by the defense that um, that in fact there was some reference by one of the analysts that that she had asked for Santos's. DNA and it was never provided and the defense certainly pointed out that in these reams of I mean there were maybe two dozen um, pieces of DNA evidence that Santos's DNA had never been checked against any of it and that was a major defense point that sort of under a Bowdoin analysis yes yes absolutely and then there were other small pieces of, of evidence as, as my brother pointed out there was hair that, that had never been a hair that had never been identified um, and um, of course, there was, you know, the, the defense made a, made a strong issue out of the clothing discrepancies as to what he, he might have been wearing. Um, I, I think that the, the, the judge's ruling as to both the third party culprit and the Bowdoin evidence was, was very strongly supported. Um, this court has been clear that, that a judge has broad discretion to exclude um, unreliable uh, third-party culprit evidence, and even Bowdoin evidence, um, particularly when it's hearsay. Um, and in this case, the, the two major things that the defendant wanted to put in were these reported threats um, from Santos, which were based on two, three, four levels of hearsay, you know, only one of which could ever really be accounted for in, in any evidentiary way. Um, and with regard to, there was a statement that, that began with Genesis to a trooper. And there was another statement that began with an individual named Edward Lariano to um, Trooper Dowling. And with regard to Edward Lariano's um, statement, which also communicated a threat, um, the judge 
the judge found that, that he had just changed his story too many times, that, that the trooper said that he, he vacillated as to whether he'd heard it from the daughter of the victim or if another family member had told him that the daughter had told them that, that this had been set. Um, there were just multiple levels of hearsay, and um, there were, as I think Justice Hines pointed out, no substantial connecting links um, to this case um, to, to bring that evidence, to bring that evidence in, and that the judge was well within her discretion. Um, in excluding that evidence. If, does the court have any further questions? I'd be happy to address. Okay. And I would rest Thank in my brief. Thank you very much. Thank you.